it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Paula Arlada, uh, who's a uh, professor at the Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology at Harvard, as well as an institute member at the Broad Institute. And she's really gonna talk to us about organoids. In particular, human brain chimeroids as avatars to study individual variation in response to disease risk. Super exciting. All right. Thank you so much um, for having me here. As Faye alluded to, I am not a geneticist. I'm a neurobiologist. And what I'm very interested in understanding is the human brain, and in particular, how the human brain is made, how it functions, and how it's affected by certain diseases. So the diseases we are very interested in are neurodevelopmental diseases, such as autism spectrum disorder, and broader neuropsychiatric diseases like schizophrenia and bipolar disorders. Now, as we try to build on the incredible new genetic knowledge that we have of this pathology, to try to make that link between genetics and biology, so cell type specific effects of that genetics, what happens really inside a tissue as complex as the, as the brain in the context of genetics of schizophrenia, for example, we meet a fundamental snug, and the snug is here. So mo we need models that have certain features in order to really uh, begin to go from genetics to understanding of disease and mechanisms. And, and when we think about the brain, the snug, the first snug is this one, is the fact that I don't have to you know, you don't have to be a neurobiologist to know that there is enormous specialization in the human brain that is not always represented in the brain of other species. So mice are great, and they should be used as models to understand the brain. I use them in my own lab. But there will be a limit to the shared biology between human brain and mouse brain that would allow us to use mice to predict something about humans. The second is that the genetic pictures, and again, I'm not a geneticist, but I'm going to give you sort of the <laughs> overarching here. The genetic pictures that emerge from so far for these complex uh, psychiatric diseases is not that, or very, very rarely, is that of single genes being affected. It's really genetics of the genome where many, many variants of small effect would contribute to probability of disease manifestation, which really means that in order to understand and take that genetic picture and make it be your entry point to understand what happens within the brain, you need to use the human genome, the genome of that patient. Um, and for that, there is no other way out than using a human model with that human genome. So the mouse will not be very useful for that, although it can become useful in transplantation processes and so on and so forth that we can discuss. And so there is a need. Not only there is a need here for a variety of different models, and, and again, mice will always be a central piece here, but for this particular pathology and for a tissue that specializes the human brain, we need also human models. And so many, many years ago, we began to think about ways that we can actually um, generate models of the brain. The brain is that funny tissue that you kind of cannot have in a lab. You cannot make brain from brain, so you cannot have a small biopsy of human brain and then pretend to make more brain, and it's not an accessible tissue within, um, within the body. Um, it also, um, um, you know, there are many, many uh, phases of development and function of the brain um, where the brain is very, very different during development versus, for example, adulthood. And so building on a lot of work by um, Yoshiki Sasai and Jorgen Oblich and many others, uh, we decided to um, see if we could use sort of our knowledge of developmental biology to go from pluripotent stem cells or from stem cells to some sort of model, an organoid, of the human brain. And we knew that in order to make the human brain, we had to you know, solve this problem of being able to grow these organoids in culture for a very, very extended periods of time. Because at the end of the day, we want a model that actually reproduces something that you see endogenously in the brain. All of the different cell types in a reproducible manner, with proper connectivity, with networks and circuits that will react to stimuli in the proper way. The brain, not, not something, not a bunch of cells uh, put together. And so this work started by uh, Georgia Quadrato in my lab led to the production of pretty advanced brain organoid models that we can grow in the lab for a very, very long time. The oldest organoids that we've been able to grow have been growing in lab for seven years. So they can really pr 
progress and develop uh, extensively. For those of you who have never seen this organo, this is Georgia in the lab. They grow inside bioreactors, so big flasks with media. At the bottom of them, at the bottom of the media, you see these little particles spinning. It's the size of an apple seed, about five millimeters in diameter. Um, and this is, for all intent or purposes, a tiny, tiny portion, a tiny little piece of the developing cerebral cortex, except it was made from a sample of blood that became a stem cell, then was turned into uh, a brain organoid. Now, over time, we had to address some fundamental issues with these models. They are no, by no means perfect, but they are the most advanced model for the human brain in the lab that we can experimentally play with and do all of the things that Eric and Mark were talking about, all the at scale perturbation studies to really understand how complex genetics, what complex genetics does to a variety of cells of the brain, to a variety of processes of the brain. And one thing that was very important here to solve was the fact that contrary to what happens in an embryo, where every time an embryo makes a brain, kind of makes the same brain, every time a scientist was making an organoid, we were making a slightly different organoid. There was no reproducibility. Now, this was solved by Silvia Velasco, Anna Schiano, Amanda Kedago in a series of papers uh, where they were able to grow these organoids for a very extended, extensive period of time, and then sequence individual organoids, and we sequence many, many of them in collaboration with Joshua Levin here at the Broad and Aviv Regev, and shown that in separate experiments, this is one experiment and this is the second experiment, um, individual organoids would make all of the compendia of cell types of the cerebral cortex, and each organ would make the companion of cells. So they were reproducible, and their entire process of development was reproducible. So with these organoids at hand, we ask a question. The question was, could human brain organoids become a model for a complex disease, for example, like autism spectrum disorder? And we decided to test this, and I'm just going to show you a couple of slides because it's published, but to make the point that one could take these organoids and begin to ask how more simple genetic hits, these are hit on protein coding genes, which in autism are very, very rare um, um, situations, what these genes do to human cells and to processes of the human brain. And so here, um, um, this was a collective effort by four postdocs in my lab who really wanted to begin to ask these questions about the cell types affected in autism, the biological processes affected, the time during development when these processes would be affected, and so on and so forth. Whether there was convergence among these different mutations in processes affected, can we begin to bucket this, these effects? And what is the role of the human genetic background even for the action of this highly penetrant type of mutations. So they chose um, you know, what were at that time three powerful top hits from um, GWAS of autism. These are CHD8, RID1B, and SUV420H1. They generated organoids of stem cells that carry the mutation found in patients, and then uh, had isogenic control for comparison and ran a bunch of high throughput measurements. And I'm just going to show you three slides of this. It's a larger body of work, but it gives you the sense that these organoids, as we continue to develop them and improve them and make them really experimental models for the brain, can begin to tell us something about what these genes do and perhaps what more complex genetic states in the future do. And so here is an example of three single organoids, a single cell RNA seq. Uh, in control versus one of these mutants. And you see immediately that among all of the different cell types that this organoid make, there was a specific population of neurons. These are different stages in the green, the different stages of development of the GABAergic interneurons of the cerebral cortex. And what we found, that there was an increase in the number of these interneurons. This was found in the second mutation as well, RN1B, and in the third mutation as well, CHD8. So there was a bit of convergence. So first of all, there was a population of cells that appeared to be more affected than all of these other cells that were present within the organoid. We didn't know it in advance. We just had a lot of cells and began to test which one would be affected. And led us later to the discovery that all of this is due to a, um, um, 
a change in the speed of development of different populations of the brain relative to each other, which we know from a lot of prior work in the, in the, done in the lab and in, by other groups, can really control the function of a neural network within, within the cerebral cortex. So we were very excited about this work because it was the first time that we could begin unbiasedly to use the organoid to tell us something about genetic states albeit simple, in this case, associated with disease. Now, one of the most, perhaps, interesting piece of data that came out of this study was the fact that when we engineered our mutations in the IPS line and then made organoid, we engineered them in a series of different IPS line. In other words, in different genomic context. And when we did that, what we observed for all of these mutations, that there was substantial, the phenotype was always the same, but there was substantial variability and variation, no variability, variation in the penetrance of the phenotype, such as some donors were more permissive for the manif manifestation of this uh, phenotype versus others. And really, after a lot of work, really um, got us to think more and more about uh, genetic backgrounds. We knew from the genetic studies and from, and from the clinics that this matters. Not every person that carries a mutation in one of these genes would have the same clinical manifestation. Um, but it made us think about the need to really develop experimental models that had the complexity of the human brain, that were reproducible, that were scalable, that could be manipulated genetically, but also where the human genome context could be studied. And um, this led us to think that um, the problem here is that not only were different from mice, but we're also different from each other. And so now we really, if we want to address genetics as complex as the one associated with psychiatric disease, we can't ignore, ignore this fact. The fact that different people, the cells of different people, will respond differently to a variety of things, being therapeutics, being genetics, being hits from the environment. Uh, this is just a reality. So can we solve this by producing a model that can address at scale the issue of species specificity and the issue of differences among individuals of the same species? And so this is where this new work uh, came to be. The idea here is simple, uh, is that um, the idea would be to be able to generate an organoid, which we ended up calling chimeroid, starting from the cells of many people. Um, and um, the beauty of this, if this worked, was that we would be able in a single organoid to co-develop cells of multiple individuals, effectively eliminating the batch effect that sometimes occur when you grow organoid from different people separately, and also scaling up the ability to look at a distinct individual dramatically to, compared to what we had done before. And that if these chimeroids could be generated, then of course they could be hit by a variety of stressors of any type. It could be disease, it could be viruses, it could be drugs, activity, and so on and so forth. And if we could decode out the effect of all this perturbation on specific cell types and recognize the donor origin of those cells, then we would generate an enormous amount of data on such perturbations at scale. Um, now, this sounds very simple. All you have to do is to take a bunch of pluripotent stem cells, mix them together, and then make your organoid. And that's what I thought we were going to do when I first started this. <laughs> this is going to take nothing. Just mix the cells, go ahead and do it. The reality is that when you mix stem cells from many people and you try to make an organoid out of it, one of those stem cells always wins the race and will completely take over the organoids. You start with many, you end with one. Then you take that one out because you hate it. And then the another one inside that organoid will take over. And it's a battle that you cannot win. And so uh, after a lot of trying, we decided the approach had to be completely different. We took a page from the book of development and realized that while pluripotent stem cells, which are usually the cells we start these organoids with, have a lot of potential, meaning they can become many things, they can proliferate at different rates, and so on and so forth, the next stem cell over, the neural stem cell that is 
sort of uh, more prime to become nervous system, as much more restricted potential proliferates late, does less things than the pluripotent stem cells. And if you go even later in a neural progenitor cell, um, the potential is still, it's even more um, uh, restricted. And so what Noel and Irene did here was to start organoid from neural stem cells. Now, this was also not a given because nobody knew if we could make these organoids from, stem, from neural stem cells. And so what they did was to generate embryo bodies from separate donors, then dissociate them and mix them together at the neural stem cell stage, make a, an organoid, and they can make these beautiful organoids that look indistinguishable from organoid made from single donors. And now if you look at the donor composition inside this organoid, this is a mix of four, this is a mix of five, you can see that all of the different donors are represented. And you can even solve, I don't show you the data today, situation in which one donor end up being represented less than another donor by simply tuning where, what you mix between the neural stem cells and the neural progenitor cells. The more difficult your stem cell are, you move to the right, the easiest you move to the left. Uh, okay, so what do these chimeroids look like? If we take um, a chimeroid produced by the mixing of this four donor or this five donor and do single cell RNA-seq and then decode out the donor origin of the cells, what you can see is that in each one of these chimeroids, these again were grown together, each donor produces all of the different cell types present inside a chimeroid, which again, in this case, are cells of the cerebral cortex, but we can also make organoids of the basal gun and another brain, of the retina and other brain, um, brain regions. So the chimeroids can be made. They can be made by mixing stem cells by different people. They are equally reproducible as the single donor, um, the single donor organoid. Um, and, uh, um, and yet allow us to sort of scale up this human representation within organoid and produce much more complex and rich databases. So the question here, can we use a chimeroid to begin to see if we can decode differential responses by the cells of different people to perturbations? Now, the perturbations that we uh, decided to, um, to choose were neurotoxic triggers in particular, triggers that affect the development of the brain. Again, we're developmental neurobiologists. We're very interested in ASD and neurodevelopment. And we knew from a lot of work in the clinics that alcohol, uh, as well as valproic acid, when taken during pregnancy, can affect the development of the brain of the baby. Um, this is valproic acid, is a drug taken for epilepsy that sometimes needs to be taken during pregnancy, and, and ethanol, everybody knows that we shouldn't drink during pregnancy. Now, the interesting thing clinically is that there is a huge amount, very, very high phenotypic variability in how the brain of different babies would react to exposure to these two compounds. And so the question, basically, not every baby that is born from an alcoholic mother would have problems in the development of the brain, and not every baby um, that is exposed to valproic acid would, have an, would, would develop autism, which is an increased risk um, for exposure to this drug. So is it possible to do this? We did the experiment. So we generated chimeroid mixing different donors and then exposed them to either ethanol or valproic acid uh, for a certain amount of time, then wait a little bit, and at about three months, which is a good point in time in the development of organoid when the majority of the cells of the cerebral cortex are made, here have these organoids, we use single cell RNA sequence to understand what BPA and ethanol do, what cell types are affected, and is there variation in response to these drugs by different donors? So question number one. So here is the control, untreated or treated with vehicle. Here is the ethanol, and here's the VPA down here, the bottom row. And, what you can, and, and uh, uh, the columns are the different donors that were mixed inside these chimeroids. And I'm showing you the individual donor that were computationally decoded out um, of the uh, mixed chimeroid. Again, every one of these uh, chimeroid produces all of the cell types that we expect to find at this time, but you'll notice immediately some things. The first thing is that, at least in terms of cellular composition, ethanol looks quite similar, just in terms of what cells are there, to control, but VPA doesn't. 
And I told you that VPA is associated, administration of VPA during development is associated with an increase like probability of developing autism uh, by, by the baby. And what you can see here um, is that there are some population of cells, the pink group here and the green uh, cluster that um, are present more compared to control when um, in higher, bigger numbers basically when VPA is given. And the interesting thing is that this pink population of cells, those are the same GABAergic interneurons that I told you were increased in response to a genetic hit associated with autism, which we found uh, kind of interesting. The other thing that you begin to see here is that there are some donors, like this last donor here, that has an increase in corefrexal cells, but it doesn't show that increase in interneurons. So possibly, although the numbers are very small at this point, we can't conclude very much, it's an interesting observation because it begins to suggest that perhaps not every donor responds the same to these perturbations. We have done a lot of work to show that donor, single donor chimeroid exposed to the same things would respond identically to the mix of the donor inside a chimeroid. And I'm going to show in this talk just a sort of a, a, a final set of slides to make the point that it is possible to recognize differential responses by different donors, and that different donors indeed respond differently to perturbations within the context of these avatars. And so um, here is an analysis where, uh, again, the colors, um, the colors indicate the different donors that were mixed within, an, within a chimeroid. In this specific case, I'm showing you the effect on the donor, um, on the donors um, in, intended as the global population of cells present inside a chimeroid. And so the more distance um, the, the there is between the triangle and the circles, which are the control versus the VPA treaty, the more, uh, the more effect uh, there is. And you can see immediately that there are some donors here that are less affected than others. Now, if you now go deeper, there is a lot of information inside these chimeroids, and ask whether different donors would respond differently in specific cell types, and then you can in identify this as well in this context. And so you, you see, for example, again, that you can put donors in an order of response to that specific perturbation that is different depending on the cell type of the brain that you are now looking at. So this is early days, very, very early days. But it is possible that this chimera may actually become a system in which we can collect at once and at scale as we increase the number of people that we can mix inside the same chimeroid, a large amount of information about specific cell type of the brain, their responses to perturbations, and how um, you know, the genome really affects such responses. So I'm going to close by um, making a couple of points. So brain organoids today, not 10 years ago, but today, have become pretty powerful, reproducible avatars of some aspects of development and function of the human brain. And they are the most complex system, experimental system, that we can use in a lab uh, to study um, how the human brain uh, reacts to things. Uh, Multi-donor chimeroids, has a, as I showed you, are as reproducible as the single donor chimeroid, and the responses are very similar to, what, to those of single donor chimeroids. And yet they could become, and I hope they will become, the scalable system to ask questions about populations instead of uh, individuals. Um, with that, I'm going to stop and really thank you for, for your attention. Um, I think I mentioned the name of all the people who did the work that I presented today, and I would be delighted to take um, any question. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Paola. Yep. I think we have a question from the uh, Hi, Paola. Hi. Always amazing work. Thank you for leading the field in so many different ways. Um, I have a few questions. So basically, first of all, about the cell autonomous nature of some of those responses, and in particular the role of microglia, vasculature, and also in just in terms of cell cell communication, yes. how much of that influences? If you could tell some of your insights, Absolutely. I'm sure you're pushing these, these yeah. directions. So it's a fine dance, right? It's a fine dance between having single organoid from single donors. Uh, compared to another single organ from another donor where you're going to have batch variation and all sorts of things. But you can 
sort of distinguish the two versus when you mix them together, it's possible that these cells, actually, it's real that these cells talk to each other and they can influence each other. So it's a fine dance between being still able to read a phenotype of a genetic hit or a compound hit or whatever it is, and how much of that will be masked by the cell-cell communication that may even modulate that effect. So in our case, even for things like this, where the effect was not enormous, you, you know, we are, we are able to read it, and we are seeing the cell-cell communication as an advantage, actually, because what we are observing, I didn't have the time to show you here, it is because cells talk to each other, or especially early on in the formation, we have become completely agnostic to stem cell line of origin. It used to be that not all stem cells could make an organoid, now we can just mix them, if there is enough good cells in there, good lines, you're gonna make an organoid. So sometimes this kind of cell-cell communication that, that fixes problem helps nature make a better brain. And about but, microglia and vasculature? Ah, yeah, yeah. So this specific system I show, because it's not even you know, published very early on, we did not put the microglia and the vasculature in. It's possible to add microglia by the very nature of how the chimeroids are made. They're made by mixing, and so you can mix whatever you want. So you can mix the microglia in there, you can mix the right, right ratio of excitatory or inhibitory neurons, you can mix the vasculature. You can mix, we have made sensory system, mix inside, so lots of things. Over here. I really enjoyed uh, that talk. I, I know you said the numbers are, are small at the moment, but I was wondering if you've started to go back to your donors and, and see if you could identify features in the different donors that predict yeah. the response to the perturbations you're making. Genetic features. Genetic, epigenetic, yeah. some, some sort yes. of feature that predicts response. The numbers response. are so small that we can't do it with the numbers that we have. But the idea would be that, that over time, as a few things would happen, one, the number of donors that you can mix go up. Two, we mix donor not completely in an unbiased way, but in an informed way, so that perhaps we can extract more information about donors could be grouping for, for, uh, for responses, right? And then as more and more data are collected so that they can be modeled. So that's the direction in which we're going to try to see if we can you know, eventually begin to make this type of association, which is, would really be the holy goal here. We have a question over here. Um, maybe part of it you addressed by the answer to minorities, but I'm not sure. Can you speak a little bit about the difference between mixing donors in a chimeroid versus creating kind of a village of organoids from each individual donor? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the difference between, so in a, in a, let's say in a 2D village where you want to make a specific cell type of the brain, you have the advantage that you can use methods of differentiation where you can, I don't know, you overexpress a certain transcription factor and you make one cell type and beautiful work by Ralda Nim and others have done that. And that, um, in our opinion, helps you control a bit the stem cells as well because you sort of push them out of the cell cycle and you differentiate your cells. What we're trying, the difficulty for us was that you need to really start the process of development. You need to begin to make a neural tube and then from that neural tube make a more complex type of tissue. And, if, and it takes a long time and a lot of proliferation and so on and so forth. If there are differences in proliferative ability and, and fate potential of the pluripotent stem cells, one line will win. And, uh, um, and so that's a problem of, of the system. We solve it by mixing a later stage progenitor, if that's what you're asking. Jason, you can have the last question. <laughs> Hi, Paula. I'm here in the corner. Um, <laughs> uh, it's uh, so popular today, thanks. Um, but a uh, question for you. I mean, this might be naive, but I was wondering if there's any opportunities to engage engineers and, and thinking about a tenfold increase in the amount of lines you can pull. You can imagine yeah, all sorts please. of lab on a chip or kind of, you know, robot That's all guided. I want. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Um, so I think we need two things. Yes, we need the engineers. I would say that we need the biologists. I don't see that as a, as a conceptual problem. We know we can, you know, mix more. It's work and you have to adapt the system and all of that kind of stuff. It's extremely expensive at this moment. Like to really have enough lines, grow them the same the right way, and then begin, and the analysis is expensive as well. So we need, we need to solve that to, to make it really, really scalable. Mm. Okay. Great. Let's thank Paolo one so last much. time.